Okay, board president Wheeler, it looks like everybody is present and accounted for. Sounds good. So let's call the meeting to order. Um, and we can have a roll call for the quorum. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, president Wheeler? Present. Vice President Vela? Here. Director Zuka? Here. Director Schmidt? Here. And Director Jordan? Here. Great. We have a quorum. Thank you. Okay, next item of business public comment. Do we have any comments? No public comments were received in writing or before the meeting. And let me just check the attendance here. We have Sheldon Siobhan here this evening um, and he's for a business item, but I don't see any members of the public present this evening. Okay. Who, who else is present, Tammy? I'm sorry, uh, Sheldon Siobhan is the- um, Correct. Uh, the who else? Who else is it? Oh, besides okay. Sheldon. Okay, um, it's the only. It's just staff, which is yeah. me, Monique Madrid, our administrative services manager, Rena Ramirez, operations manager, all board members: President Kirk Wheeler, Vice President Louis Bella, mm -hmm. directors Matt Zuka, Kathy Jordan, Brian Smith, staff member Al Labossier, who is our chief financial officer, okay. Jubin Pakpour, our district engineer, and then <clears throat> Julie Sherman, our district council. Besides right. Sheldon Siobhan, CPA. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And if we just want it noted for the record that staff and board members may intermittently be on camera or off due to some Comcast internet issues here at the Mid Peninsula Water District Operations Center. Um, if there are any problems throughout the evening, um, the backup plan for anybody who might join and just to remind the board is to use this dial by telephone number toll free 1-888-788-0099 and hit in the meeting ID number 838-9345-6144. It's on the front page of your agenda and just give us, we'll convene and then just give us a few minutes so that staff can put up an alert on the website if we lose service. We haven't so far, but having the cameras off does help with bandwidth. And if there's any problems understanding staff or if we start to lag, just please let us know. Thank you. Okay, uh, agenda review. Um, any addition, deletions regarding the consent items? I don't see everyone, so you're gonna to have to speak up. I will. So Brian Smith has his hand up. Okay. Yes, uh, I guess I don't have a strong feeling about it right now, but I, we have this continuing thing where we have the uh, reaffirming the resolution uh, uh, virtual meetings, which is on the, on the consent. And then we do that again. We have the discussion separately. I'm forgetting which item that is. Yeah, I don't mind. Uh, Brian? Can you hear me? Yeah, if you could please do, do not don't turn away from the screen because you're, you're, I you were that. breaking I up. Apologize, <laughs> you were breaking up. Yeah, when you do that, looks like. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we keep discussing separately, um, meeting virtually online, and then returning to in in kind in person meetings. I'm wondering if we shouldn't just group those two together. I I I'm, don't feel strongly about it today. Maybe moving forward, we can just that resolution in with a in with the uh, other agenda item moving forward staff's fine with that at the board that's the will of the board i'm not sure it makes very much difference um we need to do an, a, the resolution if we're going to continue but if it turns out that they change the rules, then the resolution really doesn't make any difference. So 5C is for tonight's meeting. It just reaffirms that there were findings for tonight's meeting. And then 7D is to discuss you know, future and, and get a status report from district council about the ongoing uh, legislation. Uh, Kirk, if I could, uh, the, I, I just didn't quite understand 
uh, maybe Tammy's clarifying it. I thought 5C allows us to do our next meeting virtually. It's actually reaffirming what we're doing tonight. It's this meeting, right, Julie? So it's kind of not really because you have to you have to make the findings every 30 days. So if we we have we're set for tonight because we made the findings 30 less than 30 days ago. So this will allow us to continue next month. So it's 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 really looking forward. It's not looking backward. Thank you for that clarification. It's a good question, Brian. Yeah, my, my suggestion might be to incorporate 5C in the future, incorporate it into the uh, discussion of returning to in-kind meeting, in-person meeting, sorry. And then if we decide not to, if we decide we're returning to in-person meetings, then we don't, we don't need to pass that resolution. So I don't know if this is a good time to do that, to bring this up, and I'm okay with keeping it as, as is for today. Thought I'd just bring it up though. I would suggest that we leave it as it is for now. And when we get to 7D, uh, we can talk about it further about what we do going forward. That's fine. Good. Anything I, I just have Director Jordan has her hand raised. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I just want one point of clarification to make sure I'm looking at the right thing. The consent is 4C, right, and not 5C, and then the agenda item is 6D, not 7. Am I correct? Or yes. I just want to. Okay, thank yes. you. I, just, I, like I was too getting confused. No, I, I apologize. Oh. I was I, looking I, at the agenda. So what agenda are they looking I at? I apologize. You're like, that, oh my gosh, I pulled the no. wrong agenda. No, no, you guys are so right. So okay. that was another thing that Brian brought to our attention, staff's attention, in advance of the meeting, and that is that. If you didn't notice, we left off our routine section of acknowledgements and presentations, which normally is section four. Um, and so on the agenda I have printed, it has it in there, but when we loaded the um, uh, agenda platform, that section did not get printed out because we didn't highlight it. So you're correct. It is 4C for the printed agenda packets that you have and seven or 6D for the packets that you have. I apologize. Okay. So if there are no other concerns, uh, we can use the agenda as presented. Yes. And let's go on to part four, the consent agenda. Anyone have any clarification questions regarding the other items? I'm not seeing any hands raised. Can we have a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll second. Was that Zuka that moved? I'm sorry, Director Zuka got in there first. Uh, I don't know who got in there first, but I did attempt. Okay. I, I, <laughs> Lewis did. So did I. <laughs> okay. So I'll do Lewis. I, I heard both your voices at the same time. Monique, did you catch one of them first? <laughs> No, I was like, uh oh. Uh, let's, go, let's go with Director Vela. Oh yeah, my God. As a second. It yeah. makes no difference. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. Sorry. Whatever. And I'm sorry, who seconded? Director Smith. Okay. Okay, are we ready for a roll call vote then? We um, are. Vice President Vela? Yes. Director Schmidt? Yes. Uh, Director Zuka? Yes. Director Jordan? Yes. And President Wheeler. Yes. Thank you. We have a agenda. Uh, sorry, item passed. Okay. So item five, hearings and appeals. Is there anything on there for today? None. Okay. So we move on to item six, the regular business agenda. Uh, resolution 2022-09, appointing Sheldon Chavon as district treasurer. 
Thank Jim, you. you and and us? yes, thank you. So the staff reports labeled 7A, but it should be 6A. Um, typographical errors are okay. We verified with district council before that, and we'll make sure, um, like I said earlier to Director Smith, that we add to the SOP to make sure that we have all the routine sections. We leave all the sections on there and put none for full transparency and for consistency. It helps keep like all the items together when they stack up so that we know that all the regular business items will be section seven rather than you know having this misnumbering. Um, so 6A is this resolution. Um, this has been in discussion with the board finance committee um, and this is in response to the board's request for proposals for uh, professional accounting services and district treasurer services. And remember, you'll recall that the district treasurer appointment is at the board's discretion. But um, be uh, aware that we staff has taken as the board is directed to the board finance committee and talked about this over the past few months. And I share that down in the discussion section with regard to how many meetings may, you know, start back in 2020 and 2021. Um, and then we've met um, with the board finance committee three times in February, March, and April and talked about the service levels and what recommendation can be made to the board including um, the committee requesting copies of deliverables from the two most responsive firms, um, Siobhan and Associates, and then Ide Bagley. So the, the committee was pretty thorough about examining what um, would be the best recommendation to the board. And at the last month's meeting, they requested that staff work um, with Sheldon and come up with what would be a scope of work and we did that. It was a really productive meeting. And you'll see here in the fiscal impact section where I've listed the total contract for consideration this evening is an estimate of $64,500 for this, um, the rest of this fiscal year and, and rolling into next fiscal year. And the one item that we added were these high priority services of 18,000. This is kind of like a one-time, let's um, bring Sheldon into the mix with Al Labossier as our CPA and, and the recommendations that Rick Wood um, recommended. And he was our interim CFO um, from CSDA. And you'll see attached an itemized list of those types of items. And actually Al and I met this afternoon and Sheldon will be happy to hear that we've actually um, um, achieved several of these already. So he'll be happy to know when he's brought on board that some of these have already been achieved by staff and it'll basically be okay to suspend in. But ultimately the goal was that by this target date of October 1st, because Sheldon does, provides these services to Parissima Hills Water District and Westboro Water District, and based on our conversation during our scope meeting, that there would be this, um, um, the involvement would be more um, with regard to the accounting services and what your district treasurer does and what has that, what they've done in the past. So, you know, the reporting, the accounting services will be performed every month. And then the district treasurer will, you know, they'll, they'll provide these reports to the board. That's one of the items that um, will be a deliverable besides the reports that are provided to management and staff. And then he will be present to present them, your financial reports, budgets, he'll help with staff and presentations with budgets and mid-year budgets and anything that, you know, is financially going on with the district that there would no longer be a need for the temporary part-time CFO. At least initially, we're gonna see how it goes, but there is that carryover um, with Al, um, especially since we'll be entering the um, testing phase for the next financial audit, the last year of James Marta's contract. So these $18,000 worth of high priority accounting services, one time, again, an estimate, and that going forward, I mentioned here in the fiscal impact section that approximately $46,000 would be the combined annual cost for the accounting, reporting, and the district treasurer services performed by Siobhan and Associates. Um, and I gave you a guesstimate here of what was spent with Uhlenberg that ended back in uh, January. It was about $28,000 a year. But remember, please, that um, they didn't prepare the monthly reports. They didn't prepare the budgets. They just did month and close. And Jeff was there at the meetings, definitely there for consultation, which you will have the same services available um, for your, as your district treasurer. 
Um, let me see what else did I have in here that I wanted to talk about. Um, <clears throat> Sheldon was the CPA that was recommended by Jeff Ira when he retired, but I listed here on uh, page 823, the other firms, uh, David Becker had recommended that we reach out to Platinum Consulting Group, which ended up um, um, merging with uh, Ide Bailey, as I recall, Crans and Associates, which we didn't receive a submittal. And then Robert Half Inc. was somebody that Candy had reached out to, but they just weren't as responsive and didn't seem to be uh, as appropriate for the services we were requesting. So we sent all these printed copies to you, again, mentioning all the meetings we've had with the board uh, finance committee. The template professional services agreement is um, in, uh, attached and, and meets with the approval of uh, Sheldon and his firm. And then I've attached the actual scope that was negotiated with Sheldon and Siobhan and Associates. So with that, I was gonna introduce and see Sheldon, if you wanna show your smiling face, maybe you can pop on your camera, show that you are indeed a live person and not a robot um, and introduce you to him. And if you wanna do, ask him any questions or you have any questions of staff tonight, um, we're available to answer them. Do we see Sheldon? I don't see him, but that doesn't mean <laughs> everybody well, else doesn't see him. I'm here. <laughs> okay, there he is. Okay, hi Sheldon. <laughs> All right. I can show you my old picture. I have a picture in Zoom that uh, is from when I'm 32 years old, so it's a nice transition. But <laughs> this is the real deal right here. All right. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome this evening. Thank you. So we're ready for questions or comments from the board. I don't see any hands up. We're going to have maybe some comments from, from Sheldon first. Oh, do you want to hear from Sheldon? Go ahead, Sheldon, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure, yeah. Um, just going to give you a brief background. I'm a CPA, of course. I've been practicing as a CPA since 2004. Started in local government auditing in 1998, actually with C.G. Ullenberg. Uh, Jeff Ira was my mentor. He's who I learned from, but I became better than him over time. Wait, did I say that? I'm sorry. Um, so bottom line is since 1998, my focus has been local government audits, nonprofit audits, single audits, federal audits. Um, in addition to that over the years, I've provided consulting, bookkeeping services, CFO services and whatnot, as it may be. Uh, more currently, 2009, I started my own firm, Javon and Associates. Uh, Jeff was actually a partner at my firm for a short time until he retired. Um, at the end there, he moved his audit practice out. And um, so we merged that side of things. And then looking um, forward, um, well, I should say, looking back the last couple, three years, I've really gotten into um, consulting and accounting and really treasurer-type treasurer, treasurer -type roles for um, some of our clients, such as City of Lincoln, Carissima, Westboro Water District, we've actually been providing services, uh, compilation bookkeeping services to them for a number of years, probably about eight, nine years now. Uh, and I used to audit Westboro way back um, in the early 2000s. So, you know, essentially right now on, in our client list, in addition to the bookkeeping and consulting services, we have about 200 audit engagements um, include, and, and most of that is local governments, a good portion of its nonprofit. Um, and those local governments include a good mix of uh, water districts, special districts, sanitary districts, um, in addition to cities that have water and sewer. So um, I bring 23 years of the best possible experience I can bring to the table. Thanks, Sheldon. Uh, does anyone on the board have a question for Sheldon? Matt, you have your mic on. No, I mean, I was just going to say, uh, Tammy, thank you for, you know, summarizing um, the background. This has been kind of a long, I would say, involved conversation um, with a lot of opinions going back and forth um, with the Finance Committee back when Director Warden was here. Uh, about what role do we need, what role do we want, two different things potentially. Um, there were differing opinions about the, the, you know, the need for treasurer services, CPA services, you know, monthly reporting and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like there's been a lot of conversation getting us to here. And while the conversation today, today might be somewhat underwhelming, it's not re reflective of all the thought that's been put into getting us to here. Um, 
And, uh, you know, Sheldon, welcome aboard. Um, presuming you get, you know, a motion to pass the resolution, um, I would say welcome aboard, not to presume that. Um, but I, I, I am happy that we're here personally. I do think that this is, you know, another step for, um, in, you know, it was a great conversation about do we have a resident uh, treasurer versus not, you know, and I think we had a lot of healthy conversation about that. I'm, I'm personally very thankful that we ended up in the position we're in. So look forward to um, uh, working with you and um, moving the district forward. So um, I'll, you know, if anybody else wants to speak, but certainly be supporting moving forward on this. Thanks, Matt. Lewis, you have your mic on? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, Sheldon, um, remind me, who was that treasurer that used to attend our meetings uh, before Jeff Ira? You know him. If you've been with C.G. Ullenberg. Are you talking about Bob Bersanti? Bersanti. Bersanti. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah, I can tell that's you some stories about Bob. Good old Bob. <laughs> I, I do want to point out this meeting is being recorded it is recorded and <laughs> online that's right yeah. i would never say anything detrimental to bob there you go <laughs> no, good man good man i i uh, worked with him on this board for probably about three or four years before you know uh jeff ira took over his spot you know with the with the district so anyway um i uh <clears throat> I, I was uh, kind of pleased that there were very few or no comments today, which means that uh, the homework and the research was done very carefully before. Um, if we got into a lot of discussions today and a lot of questions, that means that uh, uh, there's still a lot of uh, uncertainties about this uh, selection and um, the uh, the few comments that we have today for Sheldon means that we we have done a good job coming to this uh, point today. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, uh, we have this uh, issue under our belt. So, so thank you everyone that was involved um, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with Sheldon. Thanks Liz. Yeah, I would like to also thank the staff and how diligent they've been on this particular issue. And uh, it has gone on a long time, but we've been very uh, uncertain about exactly what we wanted to get and how it's going to have to change from what we were doing before with a lot more work being done at the staff level uh, as opposed to by the accounting group so but i am very happy with the staff recommendation thanks kirk uh if there are no other comments and i don't see anybody's microphone being open we can entertain a motion Um, I'll move to approve resolution 2022-09. I second. Very well. Uh, roll call. Okay, Director Zuka. Yes. Vice President Vela. Yes. Director Schmidt. Yes. Director Jordan. Yes. And President Wheeler. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Congratulations, Sheldon. And I should have noted that his official start date will be May 1st. And that was noted in the contract. So thank so you, Sheldon, for being here. Again next month. He will be here next month. Yes, I will be there next month. And thank you very much. I look forward to uh, participating. All right, cool. Thanks for joining us tonight, Sheldon. All right, have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you. You too. Good night. Okay, next. Item is 6B, uh, proposed regional water system alternative supply prep project. Okay, Rena, are you ready? 
I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Cool. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we've got the, a a project that we want to discuss with the board. Uh, get some feedback for you, and hopefully uh, direction to continue on participating with the project. Uh, as as we all know, uh, the regional water system uh, operated by the SFPUC is our only source of water supply into the district and the many uh, agencies up and down the peninsula. Uh, so we're not unique, but. Uh, uh, one of the things that San Francisco or the SFPC is always doing is looking for alternative water supplies. And so if you had a chance when you're reading through the report, you'll probably have noticed on page 42, and you don't have to go there, Tammy, but on page 42, you'll see a list of six uh, alternative water supply projects that the SFPUC is currently working on in one stage or another. This one happens to be one. Here recently, it's gotten a little more treadway, uh, but uh, what I'm going to share with you, uh, if you uh, go to page 36, you'll see that this is, has been going on oh, for a number of years now, actually almost six years now, uh, because of climate change, uh, some environmental regulations that are affecting the regional water system and our wastewater treatment facilities. And so uh, some, some agencies here in the Bay Area got together in 2016, the SFPUC, BOSCA, Cal Water, Redwood City, the San Mateo Wastewater Treatment Facility, and Silicon Valley Clean Water folks got together and say, hey, you know, we've got some wastewater issues, we've got some drinking water issues, why don't we see if we can collaborate and do something to uh, see what we could do to improve our situations. So they, they uh, engage Kennedy Jenks, who has been working for the Silicon Valley Clean Water Group uh, for a number of years on some capital projects. And uh, Kennedy Jenks prepared uh, three different uh, studies, uh, phase one, a phase two, and a phase three study you'll see on page 36 to see where there might be some alternative uh, potable reuse projects and trying to get into a little more detail uh, with those projects. In fact, uh, it, when they got to phase three, the intent of phase three was to have an idea of what they were going to be doing to submit a, a report. It's called a Title 16 report to the Bureau of Reclamation to start the process for potentially receiving uh, federal funding. As they were wrapping up their phase three discussion, uh, we got uh, invited by the group to participate and when Tammy and I heard about that, we said, hey, this sounds like a great opportunity potentially for the district in the future to try and drought proof, you know, so that we don't have all of our water resources in one basket. If somebody's looking here regionally to try and create a water supply, uh, then, you know, we think it's worth uh, at least attending and then eventually bring it to the board. That's what we're doing tonight to get some feedback from you to find out if we want to continue down this process. At this point in time, uh, the group is ready to move into phase four, and phase four uh, would engage Kennedy Jenks again to prepare a basis of design report, a 10% a concept level of design report that would allow the project to get to a point where CEQA could start for this particular project. The SFPUC, the commission for the SFPUC has told staff there that uh, currently any alternative water projects they are anticipating, uh, you know, for, for moving forward, they wanted to have those alternative water supply projects to be in a position to start CEQA in 2023 or uh, July 2023. So a little more than a year from now. So the idea with this basis of design report by Kennedy Jenks is phase four is to get into depth, get to a 10% level so that then uh, this SPREP, this uh, San Francisco Peninsula uh, Reuse Project, uh, could go into CEQA. And if you look on page 36 towards the bottom, you'll see the different uh, tasks that uh, are going to be investigated or, or you know, uh, worked on by uh, Kennedy Jenks. And if you want to have even a little bit better picture, if you go to page 38, Tammy, you'll see uh, the schedule that Kennedy Jenks is preparing. You'll see the different tasks there. So, you know, they've got uh, an advanced water treatment facility uh, that they are going to, uh, you know, do a 10% level design. They've got some conveyance uh, facilities that are gonna have to be constructed to, to get the wastewater from San Mateo and Silicon Valley clean water to that advanced uh, water treatment plant. They wanna do some work at the pool gas uh, facility at Crystal Springs. Uh, there's some technical support uh, and so on. And then of course, eventually at some point in time, getting down to a cost analysis and in the financial planning aspect of this. 
And, and so uh, what we would like to uh, let the board know is that with this particular project, the idea is if you go to page 37, Tammy, go back, uh, sorry, uh, that the potential for the district right around there, there you go, the potential for a drought uh, uh, supply or you know, augment our water supply, it could be as much as a million gallons a day of purified uh, you know, potable, direct potable reuse water. And so, you know, with all of the things that are taking place in the regional water system, you know, this could be a potential game changer for us, uh, allow us to deal with some of the growth that we are just all of a sudden seeing happening here in our community and make sure that we have ample water supply, not only from the SFPUC normal Hetch Hetchy system, but potentially from an alternative water supply that's here regionally. Uh, and so what we would like to, to do is, uh, well, well let, me, let me step back. Before I say that, right now, we don't have an estimate of what the construction costs are going to be. We just don't know that it's too soon. Uh, what, but what we want to do is we want to recommend to the board that at a future date uh, that you agree with us that we should come back to you with a memorandum of agreement that's going to be signed and executed by all the parties involved. And all the parties involved, if you go back a few pages to page... Uh, you go back to the very front, Tammy, page 35, you'll see the, the different uh, agencies that are involved. So Silicon Valley Clean Water, uh, City of San Mateo, the Wastewater Facility, uh, Bosco, Cal Water, uh, City of Redwood City, SFPUC, and us. The uh, Kennedy Jenks uh, basis design reports a little over a million dollars. And uh, we kind of debated and discussed this and we kind of rounded it out and San Francisco said, hey, look, we, we've already pledged that we're going to kick in at half of it, the uh, $500,000, and you guys kind of decide how you want to break out the other half a million dollars. And so we did. And what you see is, is where we all kind of landed in here. We have not spent any money uh, on this project to date and any of the first three phases. So we've not had any part of that. Uh, and so now at, at phase four, you know, uh, we staff doesn't feel that uh, the $92,000, $93,000 is, is uh, unreasonable, but that's if the, the board also agrees that we want to continue to pursue this to find out, uh, you know, whether uh, direct potable reuse is something that we want to have in our water portfolio in the future some point in time. If you go towards the back of the staff report, actually the, the last page was page 44, you'll see a project uh, progress. This is a, a slide that was prepared by the SFPUC and they shared with all of us during one of the wholesale meetings in, in February. And if you go down a little bit further, Tammy, you'll see the Crystal Springs Purified uh, right there uh, project, at, which was known as PREP at the time. It's now evolved into SPREP. And so you can see that right now in 2023, there's just a lot of uh, work going on there. And the project, if, if it were to come to fruition, potentially could come online in 2039. So that's, you know, 17 years out. So it's not something that would happen right away. There's a lot of work involved and, we're, you know, we would be at the very early stages of all of uh, what's taking place. But the intent right now, this basis design report is to get it to a 10% concept level so that it could start the CEQA process. Are there any questions of board members uh, uh, of what I've uh, stated here? I don't. Brian, 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 Brian and Matt have their hats up, yeah. hands up. Okay. Uh, I mean, I go ahead, Kirk. Uh, either one. Go ahead, Brian. That's yeah, fine. Okay. Sorry. I. Uh, uh, so yeah, I'm I'm very supportive of this. Happy to see it happening. Um, I did have some questions. Sure. Um, first of all, uh, uh, Ned, Brenna, can you tell us a little bit more about how we got involved with this late? Was it like uh, nobody thought about us, or we didn't hear about it, or it just for some reason we weren't involved? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know if I have a simple answer for that. Uh, all I know is that as they were started getting further down the path. They said, hey, you know, what about the Mid-Peninsula Water District? They're right here in the service territory. The wastewater from the community of Belmont goes to the Silicon Valley Clean Water plant uh, east of us. So uh, I'm not sure when that light bulb went on, but it went on. And so as soon as they asked us if we wanted to participate, they said, we, we want to sit down and listen, talk, learn what you folks are planning on doing. And the more we heard about it, the more we said, you know, this is something that we need to bring to the board and see how far they want to go. But we see it as an opportunity to kind of help drought proof us uh, in the future. Okay. 
then on the bottom of page 36, it talks about using tertiary treated effluent. Um, and this is kind of a technical question. Uh, my understanding from Valley Waters potable reuse is they use uh, secondary treated effluent. Um, tertiary seems really difficult to actually obtain because you usually do something like run the water through a series of wetlands um, and you can't just grab that water and start using that necessarily. Um, uh, is, go can you tell ahead. me more about that? Well, I, I believe tertiary treatment just means it's a more refined level of wastewater treatment. And so that may involve filtration. It may even involve some, some disinfection. I, I'm not exactly sure, but that advanced water purification plant just above it, that would take that tertiary uh, wastewater, treated wastewater, it would go to that advanced water purification plant there. The water that comes out of that treatment plant would be water that could be consumed. It would meet all of the drinking water standards that uh, in, are currently in place. Okay, just as defined here, it's, it is different from what Valley Water is doing. Maybe it's better. I don't know, um, but it's kind of interesting to me. And then my last question is: uh, I keep seeing a number of different numbers on what's going to come out, or what's going to go in too. Maybe um, on top of page thirty-seven, okay. eight millions of gallons per day going in, um, and then up to twelve million gallons per day coming out. Okay. Uh, and you can't use all the water you, that you put in. I think you have like a 20%, 20% loss comes out of the brine. Um, can you add anything to that? Yeah. So I, I think you're kind of hitting the nail on the head there, Brian, is so that uh, they, they look at probably receiving as much as 8 million gallons a day from both San Mateo and the Silicon Valley clean water. And out of that combined 16 million gallons a day, there could be as oh. much as 12 million gallons a day coming out of that advanced water purification plant. And the idea right now is that about 6 million gallons a day of that purified water from the advanced plant would go to Crystal Springs Reservoir. And then that could leave an additional 12 million gallons a day going to other places, including uh, the Mid Peninsula Water District. Or your 12 or uh, six? No, we, we would be part of six that remains after six goes to Crystal Springs. Okay, so there's 12 there's is a total. Tw six 12 is a total. Crystal Springs. Correct. And then the remaining six of that remaining six, maybe as much as a million gallons a day could come to us. Okay. And I assume that amount depends on how much we've paid relative to how much everyone else. I, I think paid. so. We're not there yet, but that makes sense. Yes. Okay, great. Again, I, I, sounds good. Thanks. So Matt? Um, yeah, a couple of questions. And then just on, I mean, and uh, only for the sake of clarification, not because anybody wants maybe to hear exp the explanation, but I know that from San Mateo, they're building a tertiary plant right now. It's gonna be, um, and I think Silicon Valley Clean Water already has one. Um, and so I, I do know from the conversations that I've been involved in, then that tertiary water Sometimes I'll put it in wetlands for like nutrient removal, but it's going to get sent. And San Francisco's plan is to actually run that water through reverse osmosis and then advanced oxidation to get rid of like the, the PFOS and all of the other, you know, forever chemicals that are even get, make it into tertiary wastewater before they put it back in. And that would make it usable for direct potable injection as well, uh, direct potable reuse. Um, so there, and, and to that end, I mean, I don't have any, I haven't seen any cost estimates on that plant, but just if you assume it's 12 MGD and it's 10 million gallons in MGD, if we look at our current participation rate in this million dollar effort, that, you know, I'm carrying around numbers here, no idea what this would actually look like, but that's $12 million for one MGD worth of water. So um, at, at a 10% participation rate, I just wanna be careful that we're participating but that we're also thinking about like pretty quickly, what is this going to cost us? What's the expectation? Because, you know, $12 million to us, it's 75% of our annual budget. You know, I have projects bigger in San Mateo than $12 million, right? So for San Mateo, that might not be the same, same level. So I, right. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about the overall percentages. When we get to construction dollars, you know, we won't be able to carry the same percentage going into construction that we're carrying in this basis of design report um, that I can just doing back of the envelope, literally calculations on it. So 
And we didn't make that commitment. It is a good point. We didn't make that commitment. We only agreed to 9% this time because all of the water suppliers agreed to the same amount, right? Right. And And I I see that in there. And I know that, you know, Cal Water was, you know, hemming and hawing about their participation. And I kind of want to, you know, stay out of that. But I'm just like, I just want us to be careful in my mind anyway, that this is fine. This is a basis of design. We're keeping this thing going. But when it gets to building a $120 million plant, we're not in for $10 million, you know, 10% for, you know, one MGD. We just can't afford that, right? So yeah. what can we afford? And, um, you know, we'll need to start thinking about that, I think, as, as some of this basis of design report hopefully comes out with some construction dollars um, and we have a better sense of what the total costs are to get us, you know, across the finish line. Um, at least that would be my concern. I would say the second thing is, has there been any discussion of, because you came up with the one MGD estimate somehow? Um, was that based upon an assumption about the number of participants or how did that, how did that number come about? I haven't heard of any, you know, commitments made so far on how to distribute this water, but I haven't been in the details either. Yeah. When we went to one of the early meetings with Tammy, you can correct me if I'm wrong here. I just remember seeing a table up on the screen discussing the amount of water that was going to potentially be coming out of the advanced water treatment facility that the 12 MGD and how they had split it up into, you know, some of it was going to be going into the Crystal Springs Reservoir and then some of the other uh, agencies, you know, the Cal Water and City of Redwood City or whatever had ideas or, you know, intents to take some of that water. And they had identified like one or two MGD that uh, they, they, they had not identified where one or two MGD might go to. And that mm. may have been where they thought, hey, why don't we talk to the Mid-Peninsula Water District? You know, we got, we got some other, maybe these other agencies had, had talked about that. You know, we can commit to taking, you know, an, uh, one right. or two MGD type thing. And they, I remember seeing on that table that they had one or two MGD that they didn't know where it was going to go. And that may have been the trigger why they contacted us. And that's why we put in here just maybe as much as an MGD, but to what you're saying, Matt, it's going to be dependent upon how much this is going to cost and how much right. we're willing to, you know, take that bite. But right. again, we see it as a potential for, you know, helping us with, with drought, uh, you know, drought uh, affecting our water supply. Right. I mean, that that's the key thing, right, is that 12 MGD is your average every every year flow. And the thing about that's the attractive about this is it's wastewater. It's coming no matter what. Right. Um, so, you know, we might not need it for most years, but then we could agree to take this water and, you know, and, and all no, no one's going to plumb this water directly to us, I don't think. Or maybe they will. I don't know. Well, that's a that's a potential is a direct potable reuse. Right. But they would I don't know how they do that. There's the regional system. They might inject it into the regional system and it would offset. Um, and maybe it's just paper water. I guess my point is also that we might be able to we don't necessarily need one MGD of that 12 every year. But is it one MGD of that 12 during dry years? And maybe that's lesser participation. So I just wanted to make sure, I just didn't know if there'd been any discussions on that. Those conversations have been had. on nope. the table. You know, yeah, none I'm, of that's been decided, but with right. all those kinds of ideas, you're, Renna was a- absolutely right in his explanation and response in the early on meeting. And you're absolutely right, Matt. You know, all those ideas are out on the table. Well, okay. what are the possibilities? Are we going to enter a minimum uh, supply guarantee type thing? Right. Are we going to just do a drought guarantee? Kind of like with the test well, you know, with right. the groundwater well, are we going to do a test, an emergency or a ground a supply well, right? So yes, those things are all still up in the air for all of us, each one okay. of the agencies. Yeah. Great. That was a Thank you. And, and, and uh, I'm, I would fully support moving forward with this as well. I'd like to get at the table early. Uh, it's kind of like yeah. a water rights thing. And, uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that. You and Brian both. Lewis, you had a question or two? Um, yeah, just a couple of comments. And Rena, I think that uh, you are probably can pretty much guess the pattern of the uh, questions that are coming at you. So um, I, I don't have to elaborate too much. There's no question that um, alternative source of water is, is a great idea, and I don't think you're going to have anybody objecting to that. The question that I had was, since we were kind of an afterthought, what, what would have happened if we did not participate? Would this be something that only the participants will benefit from it? But was that the idea? 
Number uh, one. I can take this two. one, Rena. Yeah. Um, okay, go ahead, Dan. No, no. Um, so you see that Bosque is a, a member, right? Or is, a, Correct. is, a, is, is at the table. That's what we I was would, getting we into. Just, I mean, we, okay. we are through it through Bosque anyway, yeah. you know. Okay, but, right. so and I, the SOPUC, the regional yeah, I'm system. Yeah, I'm glad you're bringing it up because it, it is a point to be made. Um, we would have just been in there, and for whatever reason, that supply of water would have just been in the regional water system supply, right? Mo much like what we've talked about before with Los Vaqueros, right? That there wouldn't have been. Been, um, some supply appointed to us. And so when um, Redwood City actually reached out to me is how we got involved. Okay, hey, would you be interested in hearing or joining a meeting to hear about this prep project? And that's when I said, heck yeah, we would. <laughs> because we do want to make sure since it is in this service territory, is there going to be some benefit? Could we could we have a benefit from this? So, and that's where it began. It was over a year ago, probably about 18 months ago when we had the initial meeting. And then like Rena said, we have not put any money into this and still haven't to date. So um, it so we will we will have this benefit and we will have the benefit from the supply being in the regional water system. OK, so that question got asked by Foster City. They were a member. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, um, Foster City said they could only commit a couple of percent. OK, and I didn't mean to be the one who brought it up, but I just felt like during the meetings that if all water suppliers were going to agree to the same percentage, much like Cal Water wanted to say they only wanted to put in 5%, no offense to either agency, they were trying to do the best they could based upon their financial you know, commitments. I just said I didn't think it was fair. If we're all in this together, then we should be paying the same percentage, right, at this planning phase. So uh, Foster City decided to bounce out. And so... There's still, just like we answered, responded to Matt, it's still, we don't know exactly what the percentages will be, okay, at the end of the day, but it's worthwhile getting through this design um, report to see if maybe that's going to be broken out more and, and see where it might be feasible, it's mm -hmm. feasible, especially with the cost, the total mm -hmm. cost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, what, uh, the reason I asked this is because um, later on, we're going to be discussing budget and there is a projection for a shortfall in the budget, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And I go like, seriously? So we're going to throw $100,000 at this when we know that we could still benefit from it, even if we don't participate? We won't and benefit to the same level. I, I should make that clear. We will. This this allows us, the seat at the table allows us to get in and be a direct, I'm just going to use this term. I'm not saying this is, I'm making this up, a direct beneficiary where through the Bosca uh, as a member agency, it will be more of an indirect beneficiary, okay. meaning that the total supply would be available, whatever might be produced or whatever is available to the, the regional water system, where here it would be identified for Mid Peninsula Water District, depending on where we decide to land. Is it going to be a drought supply? Is it mm -hmm. going to be a forever supply? or a minimum supply guarantee type thing. Those things still have yet to be decided or determined. All right. So uh, without having to, uh, you know, belabor the point, um, Tammy, I'm going to tell you right now that the cost is a concern, mm -hmm. especially if we're looking at the budget the way we're looking at for next year. Um, so I am all in favor of uh, uh, doing whatever we can for uh, alternative water supplies and all of that. But uh, we do have, some guarantees in place already and uh and with Bosco's participation and SFPUC so we should be kind of uh okay as far as uh, alternative water supplies uh capacities and uh, I, I don't want us to commit to money that we may not have so fair enough we do That's have it. we do have reserves obviously cash reserves Sure. Of nearly 14 sure. million but um, the reserves are are there for because we want the reserves <laughs> right so, no i know so i get it I don't, you won't have reserves anymore we, we we've <laughs> talked about it at the, and at the finance committee meeting that i do plan on bringing you to the board in, mm -hmm. and to the committee first so you know an increase in your cash reserves while you have it right and that's right. mostly to be prepared for any more uh, extended droughts right in case the bay delta plan hits us or we have to move you know from stage two after the next month or two so no those concerns are definitely um real and we Very definitely good. hear you on that okay so so my, my last comment before um, Kathy gets tired of waiting <laughs> to speak um, is the, the, the size of the agency has got nothing to do with this because obviously Cal Water is much, much larger and uh, Redwood City is much, much larger than us and we're going in with the same percentages. 
So size has no. <laughs> at this stage, no. But this stage, okay. But, right. but, but size will matter when we come to construction, right? And what will be produced and what might be provided and depending on the service levels at that time. All right. So, so before we commit to, to that money, um, Tammy, let's, let's at least bring it to the finance committee so that we can look at it a little bit more in depth, please. Okay. All right. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Kathy, you have a question? You're muted, Kathy. I'm not hearing her. Yeah, I'm not either. Stand by, let me see if I can unmute her. She should be able to unmute herself. It's listed here as all participants can unmute themselves. Let me scroll down real quick. Where is she? Oops. There Sorry. She oh, there you go. It was not, yeah, it was not. It kept saying the host is not allowing. I know. I, I, and I, I don't know why that happened. I just unmuted uh, somebody else and I'm like, why is this muting? <laughs> Sorry about that. So, yeah, I was like, well, let me text her real quick or something. <laughs> no, I, I can um, see it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, um, I appreciate the discussion um, uh, that we've been having. So, I did have, I had that same question, Lewis, like, what, what happens if we don't participate because we still do have these guarantees um, but listening to our conversation this evening it, it kind of did spark a question for me um, what protections do we have so if we go in with this hundred thousand dollars now and then when it comes time for the construction and obviously we're a lot smaller agency than many of the other agencies are are we going to get dinged because we don't have the same type of um, capital budgets to, you know, to participate at the same levels. Are we going to then just have, well, you're not going to get, you're only going to get a percentage of this because this is all you can afford to do on this, this phase of the project. Do you understand my question or? I do. And yeah. I, okay. I, I don't know that that's, I mean, we tried to be this get, coming to those percentages took how many meetings, Rena? Five or six? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was a good half dozen meetings. I yeah. couldn't believe we couldn't get past this. Um, I think that that got brought up, you know, that everybody wanted to be fair at this stage and that really it's going to be after this basis of design report where things are going to get a, a tiny bit more meatier. Um, but it's going to take, you know, at least over a year, I think it's a year, two years to get through this report, um, before we get down to, you know, what the estimate for the total cost would be and how we're going to negotiate that bargain that, but I think, um, you know, that's a good question about what protections we might have, like, you know, if we're making this investment, how does it, you know, prevent us from getting booted from the table, if you will, or maybe not being considered as a beneficiary since we can't afford as much, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's something that we can ask. And then I'm making those notes so that when... Uh... Lewis? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll let Tammy know. I'll let Tammy know. Tammy, are you still speaking? Because I don't hear anyone anymore. I can hear you, Kathy. How about now? Okay. You know what? It's so weird. Can you guys hear me now? I hear you now. Yes. Lewis just called this, me and said he was this muted. This system is muting. It's muting everybody. That it's I just got the same thing mutation. that Kathy did. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. That is so darn weird. That is really weird. Okay, sorry. I don't know where I left off, but um, I like these questions because then when Hans and Bridget, they're in the process of reviewing it, Allison Schutte for Bosca, and then even when we forward it to Julie tomorrow or Monday when Rena does, we can make sure maybe some of these questions get answered or provided for in the memorandum of agreement. We can verify that kind of information. Yeah, I, I, I do think... I do think it's important, right? If we're if we're going in early early on in the cycle to um, go ahead with the, the the design of 
the report, then we, you know, we have, there has to be some protections for us or some guarantees that, you know, we're choosing to participate in something that if we don't, we're still, we're still covered by, you know, by SFPUC and Bosca. So I'd like to be able to have some type of guarantee that this hundred thousand dollars, which to Lewis's point, we don't, you know, I know we have reserves and we're going to use COP funds, but you know, we're, we're not the wealthiest of districts. So I want to just make sure that if we're going to go in and um, put a hundred thousand dollars into this agreement, that there's some guarantees for us, you know, down the road uh, when we actually need the water that we, that we get what we signed up for. Fair enough. That was my only comment. Thank you. You cannot talk or listen until the house. <laughs> I do not know what's going on. This is the weirdest thing. Okay. I'm afraid to mute myself. Now I, I just, I just, get sent, I just sent comments to you all to unmute. That's the only thing I can think. I don't know why it did that. It, it muted yeah. me. Uh, so that's weird. So hopefully it'll allow you guys now to unmute yourself. I had to dial into the meeting. Can you hear me? Oh, that's yes. you. Okay. That's you dialed in. I am so yeah, I, sorry. I can't, it's not letting me in on my computer. How yeah, Lewis, Lewis, saying, Lewis is saying he can't unmute himself. Okay, and, and I'm seriously hitting this button that says ask to unmute, ask to unmute, and it should send you an email. That's just really weird. Okay. I'm not going to unmute. I'm I not going to mute myself. It, yeah. Don't. Yeah, then I can't. Yeah, if I mute what? myself again, it won't yeah, let me unmute. Right. Wow. How weird is that? I mean, I'm looking at the list and it said it's unchecked, you know, allow participants to unmute themselves. So it's not checked. I, I checked the organizing. That is just so strange. And the only person I muted was Jeanette because of the barking dog. Okay, <laughs> seriously. And I actually texted her and said, I hear a dog barking when you join the meeting on her telephone. Can you, so. can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. yes. All right. I am not going to unmute. Don't. I don't. And, and I know I'm coming, I'm coming in with a lot of echoing, it looks like. Are there any other questions of the board members of, of this uh, particular item? I, get, I have a quick question, which is um, my um, exposure. Kirk, to, Kirk yeah? if you don't mind, um, whoever ha whoever is on the phone, turn turn the sound of your computer off completely because it, it's echoing. It's picking up the phone and your monitor at the same time. So it looks like we have two phone numbers, and I know one of them is Jeanette Calabella. The other one's Matt, Matt, Matt Zuka. Oh, that's Matt. That's right. Okay, 7033. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I won't mute them. Um, but Matt, I just I just sent an ask to unmute, and it should be a button that pops up and says you can unmute yourself. That's what happened with Kathy Jordan earlier. Yeah, and that's what happened with, and with me. You and I was too, able to unmute. Right. Okay. Same Sorry, with you, too, you Brian. Go. Brian. Hey, I I, you couldn't have been getting feedback from me because my computer yeah. was muted. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was just on the phone. But yeah. now I, I hung up, so I'll just stay here. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So the only one that's not unmuted right now is Monique Madrid and Jubin. Everybody else has the ability to mute. I do not know what that was. That is kind of uh, weird. I am not going to mute. <laughs> I just, doo -doo -doo. Bro, uh, Al was sharing to me today about the whole sunspot thing and how close they came to Earth. So I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but it's kind of strange. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So okay. Kirk, you, you had a question, Kirk? Well, I not so much a question as just a comment. The okay. just the idea of this project is treating wastewater and creating potable water, which means that it is very expensive water, and essentially somebody's going to have to buy it every year, whether they have lots of water in the SFPUC system or not. So it's going to increase all of our costs, whether it's through us directly participating or through Bosca. Uh, so it, it's, we're going to be spending more water in the wet years or more money in the wet years for this water. Uh, and then hopefully it will be there when we need it in the dry years. And so there's going to be a very complex evaluation that we're all going to have to go through so it'll be interesting to see what happens i agree 
Yep. Very engaging conversation for sure. Yeah. So uh, our intent then, since it's, it appears that the board is supportive of moving forward, is at, at a future board meeting, we will come back to you with a memorandum of agreement uh, asking you to uh, execute that memorandum of agreement. And also at that time, then we'll be committing or the district will be committing that $92,700 for the, the district's part of the preparation of that basis of design report. I guess to, to that end, is there a, an opportunity to address the concerns that were expressed by board members about getting something into this MOA, MOU, whatever we're calling it, um, uh, to document what we're getting out of this? Or is that, there's no MO, there's no MOU attached. Um, there's so no, sure. there's, yeah, there's nothing right now. Right now, the memorandum of agreement, and it's basically the memorandum of agreement is going to be for the basis of design report only. That's what it's speaking to. Well, and, and, and you know, I'm just looking at the chat and Zubin actually made a comment about adding a first right of refusal for the water that would address maybe some of the concerns. So maybe we, we think about what language and when Julie's reviewing it, she can help craft something up um, for our MOA or our portion of that. Because they were open to feedback. They said that the team. Yeah, and I guess I wouldn't want to just, you know, uh, um, negotiate that off the cuff. Um, you know, if there's uh, an appropriate way to, because uh, first right of refusal, if they say, hey, here's your first right, you have $20 million, we have no choice but to refuse, right? Um, so um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think it's a very good point. And if we can, if we can get some sort of security for our investment, then we should. We'll mention that. Mostly to protect us too, because we don't have the deep pockets that all these other partner agencies do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it may just be a question of if it turns out that farther down the road, the costs are prohibitive for us, but others want to go ahead, we might be able to get some reimbursement for our contribution into the fees this particular study version of it um no that won't happen that I, that got brought up right okay. Rena, that money spent is money spent so like we no, didn't no. have to pay we didn't have to pay a buy-in to get in at phase three i think the portion would have been you know i can't remember what justin said or you know what they said early on you know 20 or 30 thousand 30 or 40 thousand we didn't have to pay that they just let us join at phase three so we didn't have to pay for the pre-existing phases for what those other agencies have already paid, including Foster City, who dropped out. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess the point is we could be facing the same choice as Foster City and not have the money to continue in. Yes, yes, it's a risk. Okay, Tammy, do you have enough to proceed? I think so, don't you, Rena? Yes. So what, once the memorandum of agreement has been uh, vetted by the different legal counsels, I know it's been vetted by the SFPUC, but the other agencies, their legal counsels are looking at the memorandum of agreement. Uh, when it, everybody's uh, ready to move it forward, then again, we will put it on a, a board agenda for the board to consider it. And then at that point, if they do consider it or approve it, then it'll also include you know, a ninety-two or ni yeah, $92,700 uh, fee attached to it. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, so that takes us to item 6C, summary report on preliminary draft operating budget for 22-23. And so thank you, Kirk. We're not asking for any direction. We just wanted to present very preliminary because we've only been to your finance committee once with details. We'll go back to them. Again, next month, we have to reschedule the meeting we have planned for next week since Kirk and I will be attending the Aqua JPIA conference. Um, and we've, we've refined um, the, some of the details and, and come up with um, uh, um, a, a, a better working draft, not a better one, but a, a revised one. But for now, for this evening, the operating budget, as even um, Vice President Vela mentioned, 
um, there's a, what's projected is about a quarter of a million dollar um, deficit, a um, little less than what was projected as a deficit this year. I think it was almost 400,000. Um, you know, the budget's a plan. We try to do the best we can with planning the numbers to balance it. Um, I think the board will know and what we discussed with the finance committee is that the largest portion of the deficit is representative of, of the overlap in sa uh, positions, salaries for four positions, four employees that are retiring and will be bringing on um, their re our, our replacements, including starting with me. And that, that those, the overlaps is just the months that I'm gonna be here and the other three employees that'll be here while they're training their replacements. Um, I can tell you this, that the rest of the staff is appreciative that we're gonna have that training available to our replacements because we've just been overwhelmed with, you know, new hires, uh, the training and just the development. Um, we haven't staffed up because of that development and then just bringing on new hires and they're changing or, you know, selecting new jobs after they start here and work here for two or three months. It's kind of been a little bit of a revolving door, which I understand has been the issue for many agencies um, in this environment today. So for right now, tonight, this is, uh, like I said, a quarter of a million dollars. And I just highlighted, you know, the, the larger items or what we consider to be, you know, very material changes. The water commodity charges, as mentioned, um, Al Labasia did a really good trend analysis. And this kind of goes to the question that I believe it was Brian asked, you know, about why there's such a difference in the revenues and the expenditures of the purchase water when there's, when there's these um, water savings. And it really has been that we've been projecting our revenue, revenues too low. And based on, you know, what analysis was performed before, and even I, I was looking at it, you know, Al dig, dug deeper and we feel comfortable that the, you know, the projected $905,000 increase in collecting the pass-through water rate adjustment, that public hearing is next month. And by the way, we've received one communication from a customer they own a property and they own a rental property in, in our service territory and they did not want, uh, they were protesting the rates, uh, the projected pass through because they thought our rates were too high um, and that their bill is too high. But, you know, this pass through hearing is next month and that's what we see as being um, a positive plus the added $400 to better align with what we've seen as the fiscal year consumption mm -hmm. trends. The property taxes, the same thing. They were under budgeted and Al was able to get in there and dig through and provide the trend analysis that you know they've, they've ticked up and with property sales and changes of ownership. And so we feel comfortable projecting higher revenues for property taxes. And those two were the ones still being pretty conservative, not being, you know, we know there's probably still maybe a little few, a couple hundred thousand, a few hundred thousand in the commodity charges. And, and we wanted to leave it at that just because we knew that there'd probably be um, a higher call for conservation um, for the summertime. So we're just going to see how that goes, but we feel comfortable with the projection of 11 million for commodity. Um, in expenditures, the highest levels, again, are the, the highlights, salaries and wages. And I explained here the four positions. There's, there's also budgeted cash outs. Um, and then we always include 5% um, for employee merit increases. The range is zero to five, but we just put 5% on top of that. We budget new positions or vacant positions at mid-range, knowing that it could be higher or lower. Um, we budget new positions at 12 months for a fiscal year, knowing that some of them might not be hired for the full 12 months. And so that's something you'll see a difference in throughout the year. Um, and then the part-time CFO, which is Al's position, we just budgeted for 90 days because we knew that Siobhan and Associates is coming on board, but we just wanted to be conservative um, in case he works beyond the end of the fiscal year. Purchase water, six and a half million. So that's that almost a million dollar increase for the pass through from San Francisco. We put a hundred thousand, we, we push that over into the next year because the project isn't complete from that HOA. Plus um, Jeanette's on the phone because she and Rena are gonna be meeting with the Parks and Recreation Department for the city of Belmont after the meeting I've had with um, the city manager to talk about not only the fields at uh, the field project, um, sports field project at Ralston Middle School, but also the other properties that are owned by the city of Belmont. So 
um, this is a really good pro these are these sound like there could be some really good projects and so we kept long be gone at 100,000 going into next fiscal year of course the increased materials costs and supplies means a bump up in the maintenance and repair uh, for our operations system training and travel and recruitment they, they all roll up into one and I list here the fact that the election the full cost of the election um, at 35,000, that is a guesstimate. Um, I kind of added up one from a few years ago, a couple of years ago, which was at, or before last year when you guys ran out of post, but 28,000, I just bumped it to 35. Um, again, if Kathy had asked the question during our review of the agenda, what happens if you run out of post? There's still some costs that are gonna be associated from the elections office. And that's mostly gonna be uh, attributed to the fact that we're going to the divisions-based elections. So redistricting partners and I have made sure that all the documentation got sent to San Mateo County. And so I bet any amount of money we're <laughs> gonna get built for whatever work they have to do in order to prepare for division-based elections. So right now we have it at $35,000 for a full election in November. Uh, employee travel and training bumped up some to accommodate the um, expenses of the administrative, the temporary administrative services manager and CFO when they work on site. And then we added 15,000 to be prepared for a potential relocation expense of a new GM, just in case. Okay. We, we don't know what that's going to entail, but I wanted to make sure that you had enough money in the budget for your new general manager. The restricted earnings is self-explanatory. It was an accounting function. It should have been in the budget. Um, it was in there and I was told in previous years it was to help offset life earnings. There was always discussions about accounting functions entering the budget. And now we've gotten that cleaned up with Al on board. Thank you, Al. And then the depreciation expense was too high. And Al's done a lot of research with regard to how that's been calculated, including looking at all of our audited financials and he feels that 1.1 million is the better number than the 1.4 million that had been included on the depreciation and schedule. So those are the highlights. Again, you know, our goal is now to better find, uh, fine tune. In fact, Al worked on the capital budgets today. Wanted to make those a uh, little bit cleaner and showing you the funding sources. So um, I think we're, we have a really good working draft to present to the finance committee at their meeting in May when we get that rescheduled. And then to also present um, where we are on the finish line objective, you know, for the COP project funds. And then I didn't include in here, but lastly, it would be to present you with a revised um, cash reserve policy. I, I want to ensure that maybe one of my final actions as your general manager is to preserve the funds that you have on hand. I'm. I'm looking at proposing $10 million as your um, cash reserve from 3 million. And that's to, to just ensure that you have um, especially operating reserves in case of extended drought periods and or the fact that you may have some room to maybe help offset a larger budget, I mean, a larger water rate increase that might be projected because of moving from the different stages or levels in your water shortage contingency plan. I just think it's prudent since the funds are here that you protect them and reserve them for those times that may be ahead of us um, for the district. So um, those three things will bring back in the next month or two with your finance committee and then ultimately to the board with recommendations. So we wanted to introduce those and I'm certainly open for questions or uh, if the finance committee has anything to add or take away or Al, same with you or Rena or Monique. We all worked on this together. Otherwise, you'll see it again next month with the more detail. Now, I did want to say when I met with Kathy, um, I believe, and help me out board members, I believe when you put your board com finance committee together and you wanted them to look at all the details, you wanted one time a year to see all the details and that would be at approving the budget. And if I see your heads nodding up and down, then when we present the budget to you, we will give you all the details, the account line details of the budget. If that's what you guys remember as well. Anybody have questions regarding the budget? 
looks just, like Kathy. Yeah, I just wanted to um, have the, the comment, which Tammy did say when I met yesterday with her that, that I did, I did have interest um, the next time we see it to see kind of the full budget. And, and I believe that's what Matt and Lewis and Kirk and Brian, do you remember that? I think the one time a year the board would see the entire line item budget would be at budget approval time. Is that correct? Uh, I don't recall that specifically. When, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, Matt. I, was gonna say, I just don't recall that specifically, but I also think that this is the first time um, uh, that Kathy's been going through the, you know, this the bud budget development process, unless I've lost total track of time in COVID and this is the second, <laughs> I don't know, that's pl equally plausible. Um, but uh, so I, you know, I, I don't think that we need to hold to any norms if uh, in the spirit of making sure that everybody has access to the information. Exactly. Well, Fair enough. No problem. And it is my first time, Matt. So. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but even if it was my 10th time, I'd still want to see the full budget. Fair enough. <laughs> well, well, it, it, it depends on what level of class they're going to get down to. I'm not sure that a thousand different line items are going to be helpful. It won't be any different than what gets presented to you. I mean, that's the line item budget, what you get, you got presented as a finance committee. Okay. Those account codes in mind, so it's probably about four or five pages. So uh, at the next finance committee, when we when we take a look at this, um, Tammy, you know the the issue of that uh, deficit will come up. Okay, so we're we're going to be discussing that a little bit okay. at length. And be prepared; it's bigger now. So I just wanted to make sure I made your evening decide tonight, Lewis. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll talk, okay. Brian. Uh, yeah, um, one question would be if, if we're seeing the line item budget, there's still going to be enough time if we have some concerns or want to make changes and get it done. And hit yes, our that's year. why we start early. So you see it this month and I mean, in May, and then you can approve it as late as June in order for it to be effective July 1st. Okay. Okay, not seeing any other questions, and there is no resolution associated. This is a information item. Uh, so we can go on. And so item D, 6D, is discuss return to in-person board meetings. Uh, Julie, do we have any further word about uh, a requirement from the state or the county that we go to in person? Oh, you got on mute, Julie. Oh, goodness. Let me make sure she's. <laughs> no, she's. I, I know I sent her the message. Hold on a second. Let me, let me make sure I got to pull down my participant list. Hold on, Julie. I'm going to. Asked to unmute you, you should get a little, what does it pop up, guys? Does it say like a box? Okay, there you, there you go. go. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I just, I can't leave it on unmute because my kid was having a temper tantrum. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I had to mute. Um, there, There's no update um, from last month. We still have our state of emergency. There's no reason we can't continue to meet virtually. Um, and we're still tracking the bills that are going through, but nothing has, has gone through and none of those bills are urgency legislation. So they're not gonna you know, go through on a different track. They're gonna follow the normal track. Probably the thinking is, you know, unless the state of emergency is lifted, um, AB 361 goes through the whole year and so no one's in a rush to do anything um, at the state legislative level because public agencies have an, until you know, 2023 to meet virtually under the current rules unless the state of emergency is lifted. Um, so we just will continue to track those bills and if anything changes, I'll let everybody know. And from staff's perspective, um, next week, the equipment, the hardware arrives, thanks to uh, Brent Chester and Rena Ramirez working 
with um, and and Julie too because Julie actually um, sent us some hard, interesting hardware which seems like it's going to work in the boardroom and and this the goal and the objective was to be ready for the May twenty sixth. Uh, board meeting and it will be ready. The boardroom, that's what Brent Chester told me today. He was very excited that the equipment would be here next week. Um, and so they, his, his, his objective is to get that thing set up uh, with Stepford and make it uh, uh, ready. So we're just letting you know that staff has found a solution that we think will work and um, we'll be ready to have a hybrid type meeting in May. If not, then I'll let you guys know. <laughs> but right now I feel confident so to see that he can get this set up with Stafford. Julie, I don't know that I've heard before. We, if we go back to in-person meetings, does that mean that the finance committee, which is a agenda public meeting, would have also have to be in person? Uh, it doesn't. There, AB 361 is, is flexible enough that you could, you could have that committee make findings to continue meeting virtually. Um, and the board could decide that it felt it could meet in person. Um, there are some agencies. So most of our clients are still meeting virtually. Um, some have started to do a hybrid approach where the committees are meeting virtually and the board is starting to meet in person. More, what you have more is like one or two board members might want to meet in person and no one else does. And so those board members will show up, um, but the public is still not being allowed. Um, other clients are doing like keeping staff virtual and having presentations on Zoom so that, you know, because some clients can have like 50 staff in the boardroom and they think, well, that's, you know, too crowded. Um, you know, so it's kind of a moving target, but if that was the desire of the board, it's okay under 361 to, to do that. And just like an anecdotal story, I have not been meeting in person with clients and I did on Monday for the first time. The person I met with outside, but we were across the table from each other for an hour, tested positive that night. <laughs> it was my first time <laughs> meeting with a client. And I was just like, okay. So, you know, I'm personally not in a hurry, but I will do whatever my agencies want me to do. And I, I've had the second booster and so far I'm testing negative and I'm happy that I had my second booster. And, and, and even if we have the hybrid um, solution set up, I mean, you could still come in virtually as long as the board was okay with that. You know, those of you who wanted to do that, I mean, this, this setup seems like it's perfectly suited for that, so. Okay, well, we may, you should probably test it out pretty well before you start recommending to us that it's ready yeah. to go. We're actually going to do it with our staff meetings and try a couple of other meetings just to make sure that we have the both in person and hybrid, you know, our, our virtual meeting going. So good. Okay. Um, and so that brings us to reports on the drought condition. Yeah, thanks. So uh, besides uh, me giving the board an update, Jeanette's here to give the board a report on the uh, water conservation efforts over the last quarter. But let's start with the drought. So that's, that's a good one there, Tammy. So what I did this time is, is I, I put up in the front of the information to the board just some uh, um, articles I found. Uh, and so you kind of get a, a sense a at this point in time, nothing's changed for us. We're still under a voluntary 10% with the SFUC, but you know, the, the drought drums are beating in Sacramento and other places because it's not good. It's not a good picture, you know? So, uh, one of the things that we want to talk to the board about too, is at the end of my report uh, here is governor Newsom's executive order and, you know, he's talking about wanting all water agencies with water shortage contingency plans to 
uh, go to a level two. So we wanted to talk to the board about that. But before we get there, let's just kind of go through some of these uh, uh, slides and so on that I, I prepared. So again, the first three are just some articles I found. One is from the Department of Water Resources. First one here, uh, typically on April 1st, the State Department of Water, Reports, Department of Water Resources does their uh, snowpack survey. And from that, they try and and gather information. And they've been gathering information all winter long, but this is the definitive one where they start then calculating or trying to determine how much water is going to melt off of the snowpack and into the different watersheds and make it into its way into the California water system. And it's not looking good. You know, the, the, the first line uh, in there said that uh, April 1st, uh, that the snowpack is at 30% of the average for the date. That's not, a, not good at all. Uh, and it's uh, not getting any better. And then the, the second article on page 52 is just a story I found in the San Francisco paper. And it's just talking about, again, how far below the snowpack is, uh, you know, compared to the average snow year. Again, it's just not a, a, a nice picture at all. And then the last one on page 55 is just uh, Nicole Sankula from Bosca just uh, asking and reminding folks that, hey, you know, uh, voluntary uh 15% water reduction, uh, given the uh, ongoing drought conditions, trying to encourage all of the Bosca uh, water agencies to get that message out to their customers. And so now let's start taking a look at the information. So next one on page 56 is the California map. And what I highlighted on the table on the right is kind of similar to what I did last month. So you can see the uh, severe drought row uh, D2, D4 uh, up on the top and kind of an orange. When you take a look at current year, there it's saying that almost 94% of California is considered to be in a se severe drought stage. When you compare that to the very bottom row, that same column a year ago, uh, it was at 64%. So you can see that actually, I mean, if you agree with what they're saying here, things have gotten worse. Uh, you know, the whole state's under pretty much under a severe drought consideration. It's probably only, only going to get drier uh, as years go by. And I think what I might try and do is I, I will almost have now 12 months of uh, information of, of this map. And I might, if it just doesn't get too onerous and, and if the board doesn't get tired of seeing it, I might put up this year's and last year so we can kind of compare as we go uh, down the same months just to see how things have changed over the year. The next slide is the U.S. drought monitor map. So it's the same one, but it's, it's nationwide. And what's interesting to me is you can see the Mississippi River, you know, and all the drought uh, um, uh, affecting everything, a lot of the, the country west of the Mississippi and then east of the Mississippi, not quite as much. And I'm assuming that, again, they're gathering information for those other states like uh, Indiana and Ohio and so on, and they're just not showing any drought impacts. But you look west of the Mississippi and holy cow, Texas, uh, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, California, you know, Oregon, you know, they're just really suffering from uh, a drought. Uh, and then the next slide is just uh, an update on the precipitation table. And what I did with uh, this particular table this time is I took the information and I broke it up into three different periods. Uh, the period of rainfall between July 1 and March 1st, or about 67% of the year. And then that middle row area was rainfall through March, which is now brings us to 75% of the year. And then the very last rows or, or columns, I'm sorry, is just you know what it would look like if the rain was at the, the end of the rain year, which is July 1. So, I mean, you can just see if we take a look at just San Francisco downtown, I mean, we received so much rain at the uh, end of December and, and even last October that we're still kind of, uh, you know, at near normal in terms of uh, rainfall in San Francisco, but translating into snowpack into the Sierra Nevadas, uh, the snow is just just not there. Uh, and then as you can see in the in the middle columns, you know, through the end of March, uh, the rainfall uh, that fell between um, March 1st and March 31st was about a half an inch. And normally there's about three inches of rain that falls in that same period of time. So, I mean, we're just kind of a little bit behind normal. Uh, and so I just, I think it just provides an interesting picture of uh, the rain and the rain patterns in, in the state and where, again, you know, before the end of calendar year 21, uh, we had so much rain, especially in the northern part of the state, that we were well above normal and now we're starting to fall into, uh, you know, 
uh, dropping down below normal. And uh, again, it's just not a good sign. And you can see I've highlighted some of these uh, communities in yellow just to, to indicate that their percentages uh, of normal now fall below that percentage of the time of the year that we're in, right? So they're actually well below where they, they might want to be or what would hope to be. I just uh, thought I'd share that information and uh, with precipitation. Uh, now I'm going to describe here this is just a, a slide that the SFPC shares. Uh, it's a national precipitation forecast. But, you know, if you take a look at the top part, you know, that's the early part of May, I mean, April. And it, we didn't get a lot of rain in that first part of April, but we have had some here recently. So the bottom half of it shows what's happened in the last couple of weeks or within the past couple of weeks. And it does kind of reflect that, um, you know, we did get some rain. And again, interesting to see around the Mississippi River and going east, there's just a lot more rain activity that was taking place over there compared to the west coast of the United States. Next slide, Tammy. The upcountry precipitation, uh, again, just kind of reflects what we all know. We got uh, even up in the Hetch Hetchy area, they had a lot of uh, rain in October and December, but it's been pretty dry ever since. And it's not uh, normal. Typically, they get six, seven inches of rain in December, January, February, March, and it just did not happen this year. Uh, even though when you compare the year to date total of 20 inches with the average annual, you know, you're 50, 56% of average. So it's, you know, kind of average, but it's been a pretty dry average these last few months. The next slide, the uh, Hetchy precipitation. Uh, this uh, line, line chart or line graph here, uh, the black 30-year median, you know, uh, the is, is there. The red bold line is kind of where we started, and it sure looked pretty good here uh, up until the end of uh, – December, and then it's just has kind of flat line, but that's what we've all been hearing, right? We didn't get much rain in January, February, March. And that red line for this water year, 2022, is now almost tracking the way it, it fell last year in 2021, and uh, not quite as bad as 1977, which a lot of us remember that being a really dry period of time in, in California. So again, not a lot of rain up in Hetch Hetchy. It's just kind of flattened out, and it looks like it's not going to be much better than it was last year if it continues. The Bay Area stations look very similar to the upcountry. You, know, you can see the, the rain that fell in October and, and uh, December, but uh, it's been pretty dry the last few months uh, and uh, just not good. Uh, and then we get into the reservoir pictures. And uh, uh, again, up in the upper left, you see the Shasta Lake and the Oroville. And those are the two major reservoirs. The Shasta one is the one that the federal government kind of uses as its baseline of how healthy the, the fed water system is going to be. So you can see that uh, Shasta right now is at 38% of capacity and it's at 48% of its historical. So, I mean, they should be upwards of near 4 million acre feet stored in there right now. And they're only uh, at about uh, maybe not quite 2 million acre feet. So it's not, not good for the federal water system. And then in Oroville on the state side, uh, normally, uh, you know, they would be about two and a half million acre feet in there. And right now they're at 67% of that. So they're, they're below normal. I always like to, to point out that the San Luis Reservoir, just because again, that one's the big one that's not too far from us. And as you can see that you know, right now, they'd be well over 2 million acre feet and they're right around a million right now. So they're about 53% of, of uh, where they where typically would be. And then on the far right-hand side, we see Don Pedro. That's the water bank for the SFPC system. And that's one of the more healthy ones. It's at 82% of historical. But, you know, I, I was, uh, and you'll see this in one of the tables later on, that one, it probably would have been uh, closer to normal. But what's been happening is the SFPC has been doing some work in the, uh, the tunnel uh, out of Hetch Hetchy. And so they haven't been moving much water out of there. So you're going to see in one of the, the regional water system uh, storage tables here later that uh, there's a lot of water uh, stored up in Hetch Hetch. It's because they've been holding it back while they're doing the maintenance work uh, on the tunnel system. So Tam, let's go to the next slide up. Now, here we go. Here's that uh, water storage capacity uh, table. So as you can see uh, under the, the four, four uh, columns, uh, you know, Hetch Hetchy Reservoir is at 82%, normally at 61%. And again, that's because the SFPUC have been doing some maintenance on the tunnel system. So they've been holding back water in Hetch Hetchy while they do their work. And then the, the water bank uh, right now is at 60, 
percent where normally it's uh, almost full and again there's just no water going into the water bank right now because of the work but overall in general the tuolumne system is got about 900,000 acre feet in there it holds 1200 12 1.2 million acre feet so it's at 74 percent of uh, normal the local storage is at 72 percent at 166,000 uh, acre feet where it can hold as much as 230,000 uh, acre feet so overall and I was telling you, I was looking at this table, and I got this information. It's showing that the overall system is at 82%. I'm telling myself that can't be right because uh, Tuolumne is at 74% and the local storage is 72. So some math is not right there. And I must have gotten the number wrong or copied it wrong. It might have been a typographical error. But uh, the, the numbers themselves are accurate. Uh, the next slide is the total water deliveries into the regional water system comparing different years. The orange line, the lower line is 2015. The uh, yellow or goldish line is 2019. The purple line is 2020 and the green line is currently. So uh, you can see that currently we are kind of tracking where we were a couple of years ago in 2020 at the start of the pandemic. Uh, actually a little bit lower use uh, than 2015 or at that time, our last major drought situation, but but well above uh, 2019, you know, and I think part of it was we had a pretty dry and a warm uh, early part of winter in, in January, February, and folks were using water outside. We weren't thinking too much about the drought, but now I think it's starting to get on folks' radar. And 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 just uh, as a as a point of reference too, if you take a look at the back of our building, if you happen to be driving on 101 you're going to see a banner that's back there. That's an SFPC banner reminding people that they should try and save water uh, by not overwatering with sprinklers and then fixing leaks. Uh, so there's a banner back there. It's an SFPC banner. Tammy, the next slide. And then more uh, about us. This is our uh, water use chart that you see uh, each month. Uh, the green line is uh, this year, 2022. And you'll see that in March 2022, we delivered uh, 92, almost 93,000 units of water. Last year in March 2021, we delivered 87,000, almost 500. So we actually increased our water use by almost 6% comparing 2022 to 2021. Uh, the per capita, the residential per capita, and this number is given to us by the state. Uh, after we supply them with information early on in the month. And so for March, the per capita residential uh, use was 59.2 gallons per day per person. The next slide, Tammy. And then this is the cumulative uh, line and bar chart. I kind of modified this one from last month. So the, the blue line is our five-year average. And so for March, uh, the five-year average number would have been just slightly under 82,000 units of water. The orange line is our SFPUC tier two allocation for the month. So for the month of March, uh, we, they, we were uh, asked to use 77,000 units of water, uh, but we didn't hit it. We actually uh, used, as you saw in the previous chart, and then even in this one, we used 92,000, almost 93,000 units of water. So we so far for the three months, the first quarter of calendar year 22, when you compare the tier two water allocation that the SFPUC has asked us to try and hit and what we've actually used, we've exceeded uh, that uh, tier two number by 23,450 units of water or 10 and a half percent. Right now, again, it's voluntary, but we need to do some more outreach to our customers to try and get them to think about drought because uh, they're, they're going to get shocked when uh, the uh, when a mandatory uh, 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 drought impact hits them. Uh, the, the orange bars down there are just kind of giving a, a sense of what our water budget based on the SFPUC's tier two allocation uh, has been allocated to us at this point in time. And again, so far the tell us is voluntary, but I, we think at some point in time it may they may switch that to mandatory, but we're not there yet. Next slide, Tammy. And again, a slide from the SFPUC uh, presentation to the regional, uh, I mean, the water managers monthly at Bosca is just uh, they, what they call their drought tracker, uh, comparing the periods uh, from July 1 through March 31st and, uh, and just taking a look at uh, what the reduction is like. And so they're actually showing um, uh, slight reductions, not a lot compared, uh, just an 8% overall and the wholesale customers only 5.3%. 
So uh, again, I think we're all going to be uh, uh, asked to squeeze our, our water wallets a little bit tighter. Uh, getting into the last few slides of snowpack. And again, uh, the black median line, you can see where that is. And the 2022 uh, snowpack measurements by SFPUC, you can see how it started out really nice in December and January, and then it just kind of flatlined. And now we've fallen well below the historic median, and we're actually even uh, below where we were last year in, in 2021. So it's not, 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 looking, not looking good. Next slide, Tammy. And then another slide, again, provided by the SFPUC, just the water that's available to uh, SFPUC, or the regional water system, through the Tuolumne River. Uh, and so, so far this year, you know, 150,000 acre feet has been made available to the SFPUC system. It's a lot better than what it was last year, which a uh, grand total of 57,000 acre feet was uh, made available, uh, you know, and, but uh, a far cry from... Uh, where we would hope to be, which would be that almost 600,000 acre feet of water available from the Tuolumne River. So uh, uh, definitely better than last year, but, uh, you know, there's still, uh, there should be room for improvement, but I, I don't see it happening. And then uh, what I like to do is kind of turn over to, to Jeanette and maybe ask her to give the, the board an update and pick out just a few of the items that I think that uh, they need to be made aware of. So Jeanette, it's all yours. You can hear me, Renee. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So just briefly, um, I don't want to take up a lot more of your time, but um, I produced the quarterly report. So hopefully everyone had a moment to take a look at that. Um, how I create that or outline it, because there's just so much you can talk about with water conservation on a quarterly basis is I kind of um, opened with our uh, supply and demand projections, which is routine. We've done that for past six, seven plus years, I think. Um, and that's just a, a Bosca projection that we provide every year. And then um, our annual water supply and demand assessment that's coming up. We got a file on June 1. So I talk a little bit about that report. And then uh, my outline follows a uh, um, I'll usually throw a Bosca subject in there as well as um, some things that are happening more on the uh, state level. So one of the things I wanna focus on tonight and Tammy mentioned that we are going to be meeting with the city of Belmont next week, Parks and Rec. Um, so Southern Nevada Water Authority, a conference I attended the end of February, beginning of March for two days, mentioned their running a program and a lot of um, people in attendance at that conference was Department of Water Resources as well as State Water Resources Control Board uh, executives and directors. And what this gentleman was talking about was this non-functional turf rebate. And the state has decided to go in that direction with this next executive order that we're going to be hearing about probably within the next four to six weeks. That's one measure that they're going to implement. So that's the conversation that we're, we, Ren and I are going to have with the city of Belmont is how can we agree and hopefully it will involve my going out and touring um, a lot of their um, spaces just to see like where we can transition some of that non-functional turf um, and capture that water savings. So that's just a little bit of what I wanted to share with the board tonight. Um, happy to answer any questions. And Ren, if you wanted to add anything, feel free. No, I, I appreciate it, Je uh, Jeanette. So yeah, if the board have any questions of any of the uh, subject matters that Jeanette has uh, listed in her report, she'll be glad to, to try and answer them for you. Brian has his hand up, uh, Renna. Yes. Go ahead. Thanks, Kirk. Uh, uh, I'm glad, Jeanette, you brought up the uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority. I saw, read something about that a while back. I was really interested to see this. Um, glad that it sounds like there's potentially something happening locally and that something will happen at the state level. I was wondering if this is, if 
depending on if the governor takes care of it, maybe it's taken care of, but maybe this might be something that we'd want to suggest Bosca could support as having comparable California legislation. So I don't know, maybe we can wait and see what the governor does. So yes, in response, Brian, absolutely. I think Bosca will probably head in this direction, but Tammy and I also discussed kind of getting out ahead of that. Right now we do subscribe to the majority of Bosca's uh, rebate subscription programs, but I think with us moving forward where we need to capture the savings for this next fiscal year, we're trying to get out ahead of that with the city of Belmont. So we're going to take this non-functional turf approach with the city of Belmont. I think that's fantastic. That gets us ahead. I'd like to see the rest of the state do it too. And then we're better off as well. Yeah, um, thanks Jeanette for bringing that absolutely. up, Brian. You know, that project at the middle school, you know, after talking with Ashton and what Jeanette and Ren are gonna be doing with Bridget Shire is just basically those parents and the city, you know, as co, users and joint, they have a joint use agreement. Um, they've really been conscientious about the type of turf and, you know, the biodegradability of it and just trying to be very environmentally sensitive. And that's the kind of stuff we like, right? And so just because Bosca and the state might not support some of the turf products, they're, they're coming along, right? There's some that are more environmentally friendly and acceptable. And then we have to consider what the use is for, that long-term use at the field. I mean, obviously no one's gonna wanna make an investment in these sports fields and then they get torn up or you know they're not as safe for their children, et cetera. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's worth a conversation with the board, you know, depending on the level of involvement that we want to engage ourselves in um, based on what, you know, the city has planned, not only for that project, but also like we talked about last month or the earlier this month when we went to the city hall presentation is, you know, other city properties like out in front of the city hall and stuff like that. So I, I appreciate, you know, the Jeanette's really good at this. She's, you know, um, been you know involved with these these efforts and she knows how she can bring a project or an idea and, and i'm usually out there with it <laughs> um and i'm always happy to you know get board support and uh, on these types of projects but you know after talking with afshin the city manager for belmont and knowing that you know this would be well received i think it's just an excellent opportunity for us to get engaged in the community thanks matt you have a question or your hand up? Uh, yeah, and actually just a clarification, because you said something that caught my uh, ear about the tier two uh, allocations being voluntary. And I don't know if I heard that correctly or not. That, that, yeah, when, when we were first uh, uh, notified by the SFPC before the end of calendar year 2021, they said, look, you know, uh, the, the commission adopted some emergency, uh, you know, emergency order with regards to water supply. And so we're going to need to invoke tier two, uh, the tier, do a tier two calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, but we want you to know at this point in time, it's, it's a voluntary tier two. Mm -hmm. It's not a mandatory, but, you know, uh, we're hearing, you know, things potentially changing. So, you know, we're just kind of hanging on. But as far as we know, uh, at this point in time, it's still a voluntary tier two. I guess because my understanding was that, you know, it, it's all part of the, the, the tier one allocation is part of our WSA, right? It's part of the agreement that we, the, that we have with uh, San Francisco. And then tier two is a negotiated distribution amongst Bosco agencies. Right. But I don't recall anything. Once, once San Francisco invokes it, I don't recall anything being voluntary per se. There's no penalty associated with not complying. That's you're we, correct. You're correct, okay. Matt. And I there's mean, no and, penalty. Yeah. yeah so yeah, that's yeah. the that's it's the not, nomenclature. It's still, it's still mandatory. Yeah, it's mandatory. It's just it, no penalty. Try to achieve the goal, but understand that you know we're not going to invoke penalties. We're not going to right because it, it's different than a voluntary ten percent that we have yeah. in our water shortage contingency plan. Yeah. Well, they still have not, San Francisco has not levied that on us, right? Because of course, all the confusion that comes along with their, right. they're saying that there's water in the regional water system, which there is storage in there. And, and, and I know and I'm splitting hairs, but yeah, I just, you know, I, I, I want to just be careful because I don't think it is voluntary, at least, and it's been a long time since I read it. So I'm not sure that I have it right. But if we're, if it's, if it's, if it's truly tier one, tier two, we have an agreement in place that covers that. 
Yeah. And so um, I think it, it probably it could be considered could be considered voluntary because there's no penalty. I agree with that one way of looking at it. It also could be considered mandatory because we actually have an agreement saying that that's what we will do when San Francisco invokes a water shortage emergency. Yeah, I, I think the reason they haven't you know, just overly involved mandatory is just the fact that there's water supply available to us. You know, if there wasn't water supply, Matt, like in past years in droughts, right. extended droughts, it was mandatory, right? right they they right. said, hey, you are going to have, you know, potential fines. And there were some agencies assessed fines for right. sure and penalties. Sorry, Jeanette, I didn't mean to. And not to, inter not to interject here, um, but I just, just can add, Matt, this with this annual water supply um, and demand assessment, mm -hmm. by June 10th, we're going to have a state decision. We are also going to have. Bosca SFPUC's decision, and I will bring this back in my next quarterly report, an update, so Great. that everybody knows where we're at. Perfect. And, and what our percentages are looking like for for this, you know, our, our actuals, and then again with our projections for the next fiscal year. Great thing, and that was it. Uh, that was a point of clarification. I appreciate very much the update. Sure, no problem. Kathy, you have a question or a comment? Or clarification. Oh, yeah, I, I just have a, a comment on, I know you guys are going to meet with the city of Belmont in terms of some of the, and I know this, uh, the Southern Nevada Water Authority, the non-functional turf program doesn't apply to schools, but I think it's still worth investigating at some point, talking to the school districts about um, their, their fields that they have, both the elementary school and the high school district. Um, I know like I was just reading this and I don't know exactly what non-functional turf means, but like the baseball field at Carmont is in such disarray that I, I don't, I think it can only get better. And I don't know if we can work with the school districts and figure out if there's some grants or some type of funding that they could get to uh, replace the grass there with some artificial turf, kind of like they did with the Belmont sports complex, but they're large portions, right. Of, uh, land with the fields and uh, both the baseball field, softball field, and then also the field in the back of the uh, middle school as well. Yeah, I think that could be part of the discussion. So I can give I can give an example, Tammy, of um, non-functional turf. I can okay, give a ahead. couple. Uh, I'm sure sure most of us have visited City Hall and the entrance as you walk in or out beautiful mm -hmm. but that's considered non-functional it does nothing but show you how beautiful the entrance to city hall is it could be drought tolerant another example would be an hoa community center for example sometimes if you know you're walking up on the approach and to the left and the right of the building is just kind of a strip of grass down the sides um, that could be replaced in, with drought tolerant landscape and, and that's kind of what they consider non-traditional. They want to stay away from things like ballparks um, and uh, homeowners associations like community parks and community living areas. They're just looking for these little pieces, even like the medians when you drive down the El Camino. Um, just areas that, that they look great, but they look just as great being mm -hmm. drought tolerant. Yeah, which which I think is I think is fine. I, I do think that that we should still have a conversation at some point with the school districts with all of the land that they have. Absolutely. Yep. I agree. But thank you so much for doing this. You're welcome. So the, the last aspect of this monthly report is just the executive order from uh, Governor Newsom. Uh, we've provided it. And uh, I think Tammy, you wanted to just to bring up and yeah. have a discussion to let the board know uh, what's in here and, and what we're working on. So the executive order, you know, the the major items for us as water suppliers is just the fact that, as Rena earlier reported, and Jeanette too, that you know he's asked that all agencies with water shortage contingency plan, which includes the Mid Peninsula Water District, um, implement stage two or level two and. Um, and and they they wanted the date to be he requested that the date be established by the state water resources control board so that's why Jeanette made reference to June 10th 
um, potentially being the date or by that date, they'll have a date. So ears to the ground for us and all the other um, water suppliers here in the Bay Area as to when that will be implemented. For the board's information, when Bosca, when we attended our water management reps meeting this month, um, Bosca had already done a survey of how many agencies were in uh, stage one and how many were in stage two or level one and level two. And we were split right down the middle. So district, the district here is in stage one, okay, because everything has been voluntary up to this point. Um, even the governor's call is voluntary. Um, so we, if going into stage two, it, it is uh, considered to be mandatory by according to our water uh, shortest contingency plan. And for reference, since you have uh, access to the documents on the website, and I believe you have hard copies as well. I remember <laughs> Jeanette probably delivering these to you. But stage two, the the table is on page twenty nine in the um, in the uh, in the in the back. I see. Let me see what page this is. Twenty nine in section. Gosh, let me see where it is. Sorry, that's right. uh, in the water shortage contingency plan, you'll see it's a separate document and it's page 29. And stage two would mean that water is restricted up to 20%. Um, and this is when the district notifies users that due to drought, uh, there's other supply reductions and a demand reduction of up to 20% is necessary for more efficient use. And then it will trigger a whole host also described in the, uh, of, of restrictions starting on page uh, 35 of the water shortage contingency plan, which is what Jeanette and, and staff are engaged in now preparing for, which means um, irrigation limitations, you know, uh, uh, limited to three days per week, water features uh, for decorative water, you know, decorative um, water features, um, potential for um, the, the decrease in line flushing pools and spas, covering and, and only filling pools when, you know, uh, there's a cover in place. So there's a lot and a host under stage two and messaging. And um, we've been through this before. So we, we've already got a plan in place in order to be prepared for once stage two is implemented. In fact, we met on this yesterday afternoon as a staff. So we're standing by and I've got a tentative placeholder out there next month, just in case that June 10th becomes the date for implementation. We don't know yet. Um, and then it will move forward as we move forward, uh, depending on what the State Water Resources Control Board action is. So I just wanted to include the order so it's here for your information and the public's. Thank you, Rena. Thanks, Tammy. That's all for this report, unless there's other questions or comments. So that takes us to management board reports. And thank you, Jeanette, for being here this evening. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. In my, yeah, thank you. Have a good evening. Okay, see you there. Um, I don't have anything to report other than what's in my written report. So I don't have anything to add. I was going to add um, under uh, board reports. I did. Let me flip my camera on real quick. Looks like we're okay, so let's just hope it. <laughs> so this works. Okay, so one thing I meant to put in my report that Kirk and I talked about was this proclamation we received from the city. I say we received it. This was based on the city council meeting um, that um, we attended. Uh, President Wheeler was there, Director Jordan and Director Schmidt, and then actually even Vice President Bella attended uh, virtually. And so this is from the office of the mayor and it just was in recognition of the, the drought and the ongoing drought and recognition of the water awareness uh, for April this month, April, 2022. I'll make sure that's included in the next board packet since I uh, left this off my report, but it was nice to be there and it was nice to um, be part of another live meeting. So that was their first live council meeting since the uh, pandemic, so. Uh, that's the only thing that I meant to add to this that I didn't. And that's all for my report, President Wheeler. Okay. So that 
takes us to <laughs> administrative services. Okay, well, thank you. I uh, just wanted to cover just a couple of items here on my report. And one is last month you had indicated that you'd like to know how many payment plans are in effect currently. So we currently have five, five payment plans are active. Um, and this last billing period, we did end up shutting off eight utility accounts. They have all brought their accounts current and have been re-established. Uh, as far as the arrearage program goes, two of them have, uh, two of the 25 did reach out and ask for payment plans. Five of the accounts were paid in full and 18 are subject to termination in May if they don't bring their accounts current. Then the last thing, or two more things, the, la uh, the next is, pro t um, gosh, Proposition 218. I just wanted to give you some of the numbers for that. We sent out uh, 10,144 protest notices, and we also uh, got 66 returned. Most of them are because it's a bad address. We don't really need to return them back to the other owners or new owners because they actually already went to the prior owner or the current owner. Um, we did receive one protest back, as Tammy had said. We have 8,098 utility accounts. 18 of them are hydrant meters. So that brings us down to 8,080 8 eligible accounts. So 50% plus one is 4,040 plus one. So 4,041 in order to, that's what we would need to receive for the protest to be successful. So if we don't receive those, the rates can go into effect. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to say is we are continuing to develop at least in admin, I'm sure the other departments are as well, but uh, um, lots and lots of SOPs. And that's all I have. Yay, <laughs> Tammy likes to hear that. And I've actually been part of several meetings with both operations and admin. I've actually laid my eyeballs on them. So it's nice to know that those are all, there's just so many of them getting produced. Okay, that takes us to operations. I think Brian has a comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah, if I could, Kirk, just briefly, uh, meet, um, Monique, if you could explain why we have 10,000 notices and 2,000 accounts, is that for the remote owners or something? Yeah, well, we have to notify all ratepayers. So we notify the owners, and many of the owners or some of the owners have tenants as well. So you notify the tenants as well. So it's duplicative, but only one protest will count. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Operations report, Rena. Yes, thanks. So at the very top of my report under projects, the first uh, uh, item there is the El Camino project and, and the, the work, while well, the work is substantially complete, uh, there are some things going on with the contractor. So that's your closed session item tonight. And so we'll be talking about that in, in a little bit, but in terms of uh, field operations uh, on, on page 86, I always like to point out the number of underground service alerts or location requests that we have. And so for last month, it was 323. So it looks like, you know, more than 300 has become the new normal. And when I got here seven years ago, it was, you know, maybe closer to 200. So just kind of telling us that the level of activity in the community just keeps it increasing, which is good for the community, but it's also keeping us on our toes. Uh, in terms of uh, water system repairs on page 87, if you recall last month, I mentioned that we hadn't, uh, we didn't have any repairs for the month of February. Well, uh, March kind of made up for it. We had three water main uh, leaks and then we had two service leaks and interesting, the two service leaks were on the same address and it was from a contractor who's going to be getting a bill from us for uh, going through, uh, I guess the same service twice. They're uh, putting in some kind of um, conduit for uh, I don't know, it's fiber optic or communication or whatever. And, they uh, just kind of blowing and going. And uh, for some reason they hit the same service twice. But anyways, uh, we did have five uh, repairs that we had to uh, address. Uh, on the development side, uh, didn't really change. We still have 70 development projects that uh, we are working with at different levels and stages. I will point out that uh, we are uh, just starting 
with our first water supply assessment uh, uh, in probably maybe 10 years or so. I think Tammy was saying the last one had to do with the construction of the Palo Alto Medical Facility. Water supply assessment is a document that's required to be prepared for a development that if it's a, a housing tract is like 500 housing units or larger, or if it's a commercial or industrial type building, it's gotta be upwards of like a quarter million square feet or larger in size then the, the, the developer, the proponent has to prepare a report that takes a look at the uh, water supply situation for the water purveyor, and that, in this case us, and what it looks like in a normal year, in a single uh, drought year, and a multiple drought year. So uh, we've been approached by developers saying they need to have one prepared <laughs> for uh, the address at 601 Harbor, not too far from us. It's a proposed life science building. Uh, I think it's upwards of a half million square feet. And uh, we've got a consultant who, EKI, who's going to be uh, preparing it for us and the developers paying for it. That's the good thing is they have to pay for it. And in fact, today uh, I received a check from the developer, the deposit, that is going to be used to uh, pay the, the, the uh, consultant for preparing the water supply assessment. So that's what's going on in operations. If there's anything that kind of stuck out there for you, if you want to ask, feel free to, to ask. I don't see any hands up. Okay. Thank you all for letting me know that the screen just dropped out for a bit. Jubin, Monique, <laughs> I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why it did that, but. I thought it was me. <laughs> no, thank you guys for letting me know. I, it's just so weird how this stuff is just like happening. Okay. Uh, Chief Financial Officer report. <laughs> Al, are you there? Yes. Okay, good. Great. Okay. At the last board meeting, uh, the subject of the debt service coverage came up, and I was asked to provide a description of what it is, and that's what I've done. I would want to make one um, comment before any questions. Um, on the fourth paragraph, it says the fiscal year 21-22 budget has a projected operating revenue of $13,296,206. Uh, looking at, if you look at the amount per the uh, preliminary budget, it's $15,000 higher. It's $13,311,206. That's because between the two times of this being prepared and the pre preliminary budget being prepared uh, is determined to move landscape permit revenue up into operations because it's not a non-operating thing. So the it just was the movement of that fifteen thousand dollars. You know that's why those two numbers are different. It only changed the debt service ratio by one one hundredth of a percent. It went from one point eight five to one point eight six doing that, and that wasn't the reason for doing it. It was just determined what well, that happens every year ongoing. So it's an operating item. So other than that, if there's any questions or comments. I don't see any. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Which brings us to District Engineer, Jubin. Good evening, board. Uh, we have three projects I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, two are, uh, Tammy, if you can go to the next page, please. Uh, the first project is um, the Harbor Boulevard project. It's uh, about six months behind schedule and, and a lot of that was due to permitting agencies uh, with, uh, uh, issuing our permit to go out there and pobble, but now we're full bore ahead. We're very uh, Jubin, you might want to turn uh, your the eighty percent um, uh, design is is scheduled to be submitted next week. 
Um, try yeah, again. Sure. Yeah, try again because we didn't hear you. I didn't hear you anyway. Go ahead. Try You're again. You're breaking up. Okay, I was, it was, it was good all, all, all night <laughs> when I started to present um, uh, uh, submittal next week and we should be, we should be uh, completed in August. Uh, Hastings Vine, the project started construction earlier part of this week. So I'll provide a full report next month as far as progress and, and uh, with a pay, uh, progress payment. Uh, the other project that's in uh, uh, design and it's by a consultant that we hired or the district hired, uh, where Rena and I are overseeing that is uh, by Mott McDonald. It's the Dakota Lincoln Newell and uh, that's ongoing. The design's pro pro progressing well. Um, and uh, the preliminary design is done and now they're moving on to the full design. So uh, for the most part, all three projects are progressing as, as, uh, uh, as well as they can. And uh, the last thing I'll leave you with the board is next month, uh, we're gonna come with a uh, report as far as, so after each project is completed, we close out the project by reporting out all the change orders and, and how, the pro, how the project ended up uh, uh, doing overall, the capital project on budget and schedule and so forth. Uh, but that's more on a project by project basis. Some of the questions that have come up over the last six months to eight months, Director Schmitz has had some really good questions as far as um, how do we know things are going well, you know, and, and percentage wise. And so what we're going to provide is just an overall, it's going to be a roll up of all the projects that have been completed, all the capital projects that have been completed, look at their change orders, look at uh, the design fees relative to the total budget. And uh, so sort of a, like a report card, uh, for lack of a better word, as far as uh, how things are going on the, on the engineering front. So we'll report that out next month. Uh, Tammy, myself and Rena have been working on that the last two, three months. And we're going to have some criteria put in place, uh, or, or a set of certain metrics that we're we're looking at, so we can report that out. And one of the major ones is the change orders, how the change orders look in construction on on capital uh, uh, capital projects. So, I just want to give you a preview of that. That should be coming next month. So, thank you. Okay, I had a quick question, Jubin. On yes, sir. On the last project there in the second to last sentence, it says that we ran a CCTV of an abandoned water main. Yes, uh, good, good what question. What do we do that for? <laughs> yeah, so under the, the previous administration, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, there was a water main that was abandoned because it was cross country and uh, for good reasons because uh, uh, it, it was cross country down a steep slope and it was unilaterally decided to abandon it. Um, and uh, when we developed a hydraulic model uh, and calibrated it and, and ran the hydraulic model about 10 years ago, that's when the first set of capital projects were established. We found that some, not all, but some of these unilateral decisions that were made to abandon water mains cross country, although, it makes sense for maintenance reasons to do it. Hydraulically, it really sacrificed fire flows in that, in that particular uh, area. So this is one project uh, where we're actually looking at reinstating a cross country water main that was abandoned um, because there is no alternative to providing water, uh, fire flow water in this area. So it, it's severely reduced fire flows in this particular region area. And uh, uh, even with upsizing the water main and other, other alternatives, it, it really, we, we couldn't provide back the, the fire flows that, that were there before the cross curry. Uh, it's, it's, it's very rare, but, but um, in this case, we're looking at stating a cross country water. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, 
Absolutely. So then we go on to the financial reports. Al, did Al, did you want to summarize, or you want me to? Um, I can, yeah, unless go ahead. you would prefer. No, you can. Um, so this is the activity through March to uh, 2022, of course. Generally, I'll say uh, the revenue is slightly above where we should be, the 75%. Uh, operating is slightly, and then uh, non-operating is very much because of that property sale. But of course, that's a one-time thing uh, as far as that goes. But in general, revenues are certainly on track to uh, hit budget, if not exceed. Uh, we'll note, since it was discussed during the present budget, we're already over it have a surplus in property tax revenue with the, another big month to come in. April is usually, uh, well, I, traditionally what I'm used to is a 60-40 split, but I think here it's more of a 70 30, if not 75, 25 split, meaning most of the time, 60% of the property taxes come in in that December payment uh, and 40% in April. For whatever reason, it seems to be a little heavier in the December payments here, but still should receive quite a bit more in April. And again, we're already over. So that's last year is 410,000 for the year. So that's why I thought that really should be bumped for this year. Anyway, um, you know, revenue looks good. Overall expenditures are below uh, where we would expect them to be. Obviously you can find some that are above uh, training travel, particular, not big dollars, but big percent. Um, pers personal services, uh, salaries, wages, and the related uh, payroll taxes benefits are under, and that's a function of the vacancies. Um, as far as that goes, purchase water, which of course is your largest expenditure, um, is slightly under budget, um, you know, close, but slightly under. So again, you know, revenues look good, expenditures look good. So this year, I'm not seeing any, looking at the bottom line anyway, uh, anything that makes me worry about not, you know, hitting the budget. I would expect it to come in better than projected as far as that goes. And I do want to mention, I mean, we attached the updates for the two budgets, but I, I just did not attach the balance sheet and the revenue and expenditure statement. So I will send those out separately and make sure they get posted to the website. Al did do them through March 31st. Um, and I just didn't attach them when I updated or uploaded his report. So I'll make sure the board gets those. And that's all for financial reports. Any questions from the board? Seeing none, our last item of Most of this is director's reports. So in just the order on my screen, Matt, you have a report? Uh, nothing really to report. Okay. Sorry, but I guess I wasn't sorry I missed the council meeting. I, I um, had plans and then it turned out into a four, four, four attendance, one not. Um, so. Okay, Brian? to report thanks lewis um i'm good good to be back <laughs> i was away i was away and uh i was able to uh attend a few meetings of the board and the financial committee and the city council but uh it is it is very good to be back so okay and Kathy, I can't tell you have the same background. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, nothing. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you, Lewis, dialing in at crazy hours when you were away. That's quite a crazy hour. Yes. So, yeah, I don't know so if right. I would have been able to stay awake at three in the morning. No, no. Um, 
<laughs> and nothing to report other than, you know, that the city council meeting that we attended um, was nice to um, see the people of the city in person. Okay. Yeah, the, the city council meeting was nice. I was impressed with how much uh, drought issues they managed to summarize in their proclamation. <laughs> I, I just, you know, was going to tell them, you know, the, the drought's not over yet. They had already heard it from the proclamation. And then uh, Tammy and I went to the HIA meeting uh, this month and they had a presentation from the uh, sea level rise and climate change special uh, district that is talking about various projects throughout San Mateo County uh, that they are trying to facilitate. So um, they are more of a interagency cooperation forum as far as I can tell. Yeah, but next, next week HIA is gonna be interesting, Kirk. I, well, unfortunately, I, I, I'm going to miss it. Yeah, I am going to try to attend. It, it's going to be a very interesting one because it talks about the the moratorium mm -hmm. okay. on the HIA. So yeah, I was uh, I was kind of following that. So I I'd like to. And Rena will be going, going, and Rena will be going on my behalf as well, since I will be in Sacramento. Good. Okay. Um, any communications? Item eight. Sorry, was something said to me? I was saying goodbye to Al. <laughs> Tammy, are there any communications that we need oh, to cover? Yes. Uh, no. The only one was the proclamation, but none that I've received. Uh, let me think just really quick. I used to prepare. No, there's been none. Okay. With that, we can go to closed session. I think Julie has something to say first, right, Julie? Are you still unmuted? Yeah, no, I don't need to say anything. Okay. I just want to make sure everybody got the WebEx invitation. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, we did. Okay. Okay. Shall we take a five minute break while we- uh, Yes. Please. It's a good idea. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll see you in a bit. See you all in a bit. Thank you. Okay. So we returned at 919 and district council. There is no reportable action. No reportable action. And we can be or adjourn at 920, board president Wheeler. I think we should adjourn. Thank all you. All right. Thank you all too. And have a great evening. Okay. You too. Okay. Take care. Take care, everybody. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.